In this eight-part series, I discuss problems common to philosophy and to religion. My focus is our struggle with nihilism, the fear that our lives and the world itself may be meaningless. This fifth part addresses the second of three major orientations in the spiritual history of humanity. Call it the humanization of the world. What we have is one another. Solidarity stands in the place of metaphysics. Nature is indifferent to our concerns. The sacred is our experience of personality and of interpersonal encounter. Our best hope is to build civilizations established on the basis of the obligations that we owe one another by virtue of the roles that we perform. The most important instance of the humanization of the world is the teaching of Confucius and the tradition of Confucianism. Like the other two orientations I explore in this series, the overcoming of the world and the struggle with the world, the humanization of the world has been a persistent option in the consciousness of humanity. It is the default position in much of our practical morality, based as it is upon our role-shaped expectations rather than upon the abstractions in which the philosophers trade. Similarly, many of our conventional political beliefs have as their keynote the humanization of what we suppose to be inevitable. They accept the established arrangements and assumptions as defined by the social democratic settlement of the mid-20th century. They then seek to humanize this established order especially through the idealization of law expounded in the vocabulary of impersonal policy and principle, as well as through the compensatory redistribution that the government promotes by means of tax and transfer. Consider the metaphysical background to the humanization of the world the orientation to life that it proposes, and its limits, particularly as they are revealed by the way in which it deals with the threat of nihilism. An anti-metaphysical metaphysic informs this approach to the world. Society exists at the brink of an abyss of meaninglessness. Nature is alien to humanity, and the time of its evolution vastly disproportionate to the time in which we must live our lives. Nevertheless, in this meaningless world, we can create meaning. To this end, it is not enough to open a space within the cosmos for a civilization that bears the imprint of our concerns. It is also necessary to confront the savagery of society. Unreconstructed, any social order will represent the triumph of the strong over the weak, and hold the practices of cooperation hostage to the mechanisms of dominance and dependence. This anti-metaphysical metaphysic serves as the backdrop to an orientation to life. 
at the center of this orientation lies a vision of what ultimately matters. The sacred is the personal and the interpersonal. Our experience of personality and of dealing with other people is the only element in our experience that has unconditional value. To use Kant's vocabulary, the personal is the only aspect of our experience that represents an end in itself rather than a means to an end. Together with this vision of what matters most goes a method for the improvement of humanity and of society. This method is to rely on a dialectic between the forms, rituals, and conventions of society and the development of our mindfulness of other people. The social forms beat each of us out of the illusion that he is at the center of the world. They are, however, simply a vessel into which we must pour a spirit. The spirit is our capacity to imagine the otherness of other people, to enter their subjectivity, and to recognize their needs, especially their need for us. Heraclitus said that the soul of another person is a dark continent that can never be visited. It is the purpose of this method to equip us to visit these dark continents. The vision and the method become the twin foundations of a program of moral and social reconstruction. The core of this program is the reshaping of social life as a system of roles, in the performance of which we sacrifice self-regard to solidarity and create the practical conditions that enable us to enhance the sacred experience of personality. Consider three related limits to this approach to the world. The first limit has to do with the relation of this program of moral and social reconstruction to the real structure of society. In every historical society, there has been up to now an entrenched scheme of social division and hierarchy that weighs as a grid upon our relations to one another. In most historical societies, before the last few centuries of world revolution, the typical social relations combined within themselves power, exchange, and allegiance. Their characteristic formula was the sentimentalization of unequal exchange. These societies have been followed by others in which the predominant formula has become the reproduction of class, attenuated by meritocracy. The question is whether the project of solidarity is simply an ornament or a softening of these real structures, or a point of departure for their subversion. We cannot respect one another and develop our mindfulness 
of the other people. Within the enslaving restraints of these schemes of social division and hierarchy, to recognize one another as the context transcending agents, as the originals that we all know ourselves to be, we must disrespect the structures. We must challenge and change them. And thus there begins an unavoidable dialectic between solidarity and conflict for the sake of transformation. A second limit to the humanization of the world has to do with the inadequacy of any role and of any system of roles. A social role is at best a mutilated expression of humanity. And the system of roles exists always to reproduce a flawed social order. No role is adequate to a human being. And no existing system of roles serves a transformative task. The task comes first. The role needed to implement it has to be invented later. The practical implication is that we can never surrender to the role single-mindedly and wholeheartedly. We must perform the roles that are available ambivalently, and we must use them incongruously to ends for which they were not designed. A third limit to the humanization of the world has to do with the implications of the contingency and the contestability of any particular social order. There is never a single natural necessary and authoritative translation of the abstract idea of society cooperation or solidarity into a particular way of organizing social life. Any institutional and ideological settlement temporarily interrupts and partly contains the conflict over the terms of social life. But the conflict is not completely suppressed. It only simmers. As the conflict goes on in history, we discover the truth about society, the flawed and replaceable character of our social and cultural constructions. The divisions within humanity are undermined, and the walls that protect society from the experience of the meaningless void outside crumble. This transformation arouses in our hearts the desire for the absolute, for the infinite, which then penetrates and transforms our attitude to the structures of society and of culture, as well as our relations to one another. It prompts the search for structures that become diaphanous, that enable us to split the difference between being insiders and outsiders, that allow us to engage in them without surrendering to them. 
And it leads us to affirm that personal love, rather than a detached benevolence offered from on high, is the organizing principle of the moral life. The love by which we demand from the others an assurance that there is an unconditional place for each of us in the world. The love that becomes a grounding with which to respond to our experience of groundlessness. This change, corrosive of the presuppositions of the humanization of the world, takes place under the shadow of our struggle with nihilism, which either refines or destroys our faith, not in God, but in ourselves. Sweetness becomes the halo of submission, unless it is combined with both longing for the absolute and resistance to the established structure. We cannot be fully human unless we try to be great as well as sweet. <laughs>